Thank you very much. I want to invite the, uh, or, um, uh, thank the speakers or the uh, organizers for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, and uh, Avertica is my current company, but I'm going to tell you the story, the Athenic story. That's what I was kind of invited to talk about, which is an ag biotech, um, ag biotech story. Um, and it begins like all good stories begin in the beginning. So in the beginning, the Mayans created the crops of the earth. And that's a little bit of an embellishment, because when you do storytelling, you always embellish a little bit. Um, uh, there, were, there were crops being developed around the world, in Africa, in China, in India, in the Mesopotamia River Valley, in the Fertile Crescent, uh, where grains were developed. But so many of the crops we still use today were developed in Mesoamerica, in the Middle Americas, by the Mayans, the Incans, uh, and later the Aztecs w were involved. But a lot of it was done earlier than that, uh, 4,000 to up to 10,000 BC. And when you see uh, what they did with crops, it was truly, truly amazing. They created crops like beans and peppers, tomatoes, strawberry, squash. Many of these were polyploid. So whether they just bred and selected for polyploid, did they have a technology that the history's lost? Do they know how to induce polyploidism in plants? We don't know, but they have a lot of polyploid crops, and they came predominantly out of the Mesoamericas. And in fact, there's even a polyploid mammal down there that you can still find uh, uh, roaming the mountains in the, uh, in the Andes, a polyploid mouse, um, very large. Um, and when things become polyploid, they become very large, and yields go crazy. So that's kind of was one of the tricks that they used. They also had developed things like sweet potato, which we now know is a transgenic crop. Right? It's been transgenic for 4,000 years or longer. We just didn't know it was transgenic. It's got a locus in it with perfect agrobacterium borders, four genes in between. Some of them have a second locus that comes from agrorhizogenies. So transgenic crops have been around for thousands of years. We just didn't know it. And somebody either figured it out or stumbled upon them by accident. But one way or another, these crops were developed and have been there for a long time. Um, and one of the most important, one of the most amazing crops that they developed was maize. And if you think of what they did with maize, we worry about moving around one gene in a GMO or maybe eight or ten. Well, good Lord Almighty, they rearranged whole genomes. And then they took corn, which was Tiacente on the left. It had, you know, two rows of grains and they had a hole on the outside. They turned the grain literally inside out. They literally turned it inside out. They put a, turned the coal that was on the outside and made it a cob on the inside and left the naked starch-bearing fruit on the outside so that they could harvest it easier. And they did this through whatever breeding technologies they had. I've heard as many as five species may have ultimately gone into the generation of maize, and I'm not a, I'm not a maize evolution historian, so I really don't know. Um, but you can just see that the, the change that this crop has undergone to make these a truly man-made crop. You can't reproduce without man's intervention, right? You can't, the seed won't relief, release from the cob without human intervention. So it's a man-made plant requiring man's intervention in even just to propagate it and to carry it on. So an amazing, amazing crop. Um, and they separated male and female flowers. They originally had a perfect flower. It had a, you know, a seed with a, with a pollen attached to each one like a lot of grasses are today. Well, they figured out how to get the seed in one part and the tassel having the pollen in another part, and then they could do breeding. Then they could say, this female with that male, right? They could separate the male and female parts. You can breed at a whole different level. I would argue that they developed heterosis and knew how to do hybrid vigor. There's no, no evidence of that. It was rediscovered in the 1930s by Henry Wallace. They figured out how to do hybrid vigor, but my goodness, what are the chances that there were, there were heterotic groups that just coincidentally happened to work out where you can cross them together and get hybrid vigor based on the crops that were present there? So whatever they did, they clearly had an amazing knowledge of, of corn and of, um, of the foods. And I really liked um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the quote from John that uh, the age of reason is over. That was one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> Because for the next 10,000 years, not really much happened, right? I mean, you think about it. 
They need these amazing breakthroughs, and then we've still eaten them today. And in fact, we couldn't go back and remake a corn plant if we wanted to. We don't even have the technology to do it anymore. We don't know how they did it exactly. So it, it's, it's an, amazing, uh, an amazing thing. But in the end of the last, fast forward to the end of the last century, and stuff started happening again. Innovation started happening in a different way, not just tractors and things like this. We began to be able to move genes from bacteria into plants and make transgenic organisms. And that was an amazing change, you know, a real sea change in what we can do. Um, at the same time, we had the evolution of high throughput sequencing or genomics. The idea that we could sequence lots of DNA, go through and, and harvest those DNA genes and then use them in transgenic organisms was, was really an amazing uh, kind of development. And those things happened at, the, at sort of the same time. Um, the first transgenic crops were introduced. And this is kind of an, a really neat thing because they displaced insecticide usage. So, right, you got rid of insecticide, you could do it with a gene now. So now value is being migrating from a chemical industry into a seed industry. So that's a huge value shift that was going on under the surface. And herbicide resistance, herbicides are being defined by what gene was in the crop. And that really defined herbicide usage patterns by doing that. So this was, was a shift. All of the genes that went in to crops were bacterial genes. Well, this genomics was emerging, and all the large companies were doing genomics of crop plants, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're in the seed business, right? If you sell a lot of corn, you're going to try to figure out all the genes in corn. If you do a lot of soybeans, you're going to sell a lot of soybeans, you're going to try to figure out all the genes in soybeans. But there really wasn't a company looking at, well, what about all the genes in the bacteria that ultimately, I mean, these first products were all bacterial genes. Shouldn't somebody be taking a look-see there and, and harvesting out these bacterial genes so that you can move them into crop plants? And so that was really an opportunity. There was a company kind of like that called Mycogen. Um, and Mycogen was in a partnership with Pioneer. I was at Pioneer at the time. And we developed one of the first um, corn that was resistant to rootworm, and we had one that was resistant to leps as well. And that value was displacing rootworm insecticides. 20% for one bug, which is arguably a man-made bug, right? The corn rootworm, a man-made bug. Because, I mean, if corn's a man-made plant, the pest, which is an obligate parasite of that corn, is kind of a man-made bug that kind of came along with it um, as we made it. I mean, really. It wasn't intentional, it just kind of worked out that way. Um, and this value that was being displaced, of course, the chemical companies have to come in and say, well, Mycogen bought, or Dow bought Mycogen, and DuPont bought Pioneer. And that leads me to another one of our stories that I love to tell, and it was a question of, of when consolidation happens, does that create new opportunities for companies? Mycogen was gone, nobody was doing the gene stuff, and my, my boss at the time, Mike Kozeel, who was our CEO and co-founder, come into my office every you know, a couple of months, saying, Nick, we should start a company sometime. And I'm like, yeah, sure, we should start a company. Whatever. I had a great job working for Pioneer. I loved my job. I loved living in Iowa. It was fantastic. Why do I want to start a company? Well, DuPont bought Pioneer, and it was, they were a good company. They were a very good company to work for. And Dow bought a Mycogen, and they were a good company. But whenever buyouts and mergers and things like that happen. There's always a disruption, and there's uh, uh, the resources. It's the people that get affected by that. And so one day we get this email that they're going to make an employee database with all of our resumes to see where our specialities and how we could best work with each other across these companies. And everybody knows that, that, that a resume database means people are losing their jobs, right? <laughs> I mean, who are we kidding? I know what this means. Uh, and so he came into my office and he said, we really should think about starting a company someday. And I said, today would be a good day to think about that. <laughs> that's exactly as, you, as, as uh, Maka was uh, stated. I mean, that's really what creates the opportunity and suddenly gets you motivated that, well, if I don't know where I'm going to be next year, maybe I should be thinking about this. The other thing that happened in that acquisition when DuPont bought um, Pioneer is they published in the SEC what they were buying. They were buying two products in addition to a lot of germ plasm and other things, but two of the products were the two Herculex products we made. And they were paying two and a half billion dollars for them. Well, my goodness, I've worked for them for a few years and there was a big team that was doing it. I mean, there was a big team. It wasn't just, you know, it, was, it wasn't just, it was a, a good cooperative team. 
But the things we had worked on were worth two and a half billion dollars. And of course, we got a paycheck, which was nice, but I didn't get two and a half billion dollars. It's like, maybe we should do this for ourselves. And so then that's how um, Athenix was launched. And so that was the opportunity. And the other thing that was neat about it, as, as some of the previous speakers had talked about, these are multi-billion dollar markets. These are, these are pharmaceutical sized market with much less regulatory risk, right? Much le and there's still regulatory risk and it's a lot of work to get through registration, but it's not like a pharmaceutical. So what was the landscape at the time? The first traits had reached the market, and most of them were lep resistance and herbicide resistance. New input traits were coming. Sucking insects, lagus bugs, disease nematodes, these were the things that were needed in the market. So there was a lot of opportunity. It was a proven technology, multi-billion dollar value, with a lot of opportunity of, of new traits coming in in the input area, and output traits like um, biomass, animal feed traits, industrial traits, these kind of things were uh, um, emerging. These became gatekeeper traits, and this was something that I don't think anybody really saw when they are developing the first products, is that if you didn't have lep resistance, if you didn't have glyphosate resistance, you couldn't bring your, your other traits to market. You had to have those first, and you had to organize them in a stack. Well, now all of a sudden, whoever holds the first card controls the second and third cards, because you've got to have these first ones in order to, be, to build the stack. Well, this is a great opportunity to not only find alternatives in the first generation, but some completely new things in the next generation of crops and be able to provide stacks and flexibility with stacking to partners. So that, so that was the unique selling pr principle. That was the business kind of opportunity that we had. And this new genomics was emerging, so maybe we could turn genomics to solve this problem. Maybe we could start a genomics approach in the microbial area, because all the big companies were busy doing corn and soybean and wheat, and they weren't focusing on the microbes. So there was another opportunity, and mycogen was gone, so they're not doing it. Well, here's the, here's the choice, here's the chance. So in 2001, we started Mycozeal. Myself, Nadine Carosi, and Marcus Andrus, we were the team. The unique selling principle was sequence the megaplasmids of gram-positive microbes to mine the genes for agricultural and industrial utility. And we went into VCs and we told them we're so excited because we're going to sequence the megaplasmids of gram positive microbes to mine genes of agriculture and industrial utility. And they said, what? <laughs> you know, what do you mean? It's like, no, really, this is big. <laughs> and it, um, it didn't go over very, very well. And then we came up with this idea of MIDAS, the Microbial Diversity Acquisition System. And just like MIDAS, King MIDAS, who touches everything and it turns to gold, all of a sudden it was more easy to understand. Keep it simple, make it simple to understand. These are genes, multi-billion dollar markets, proven technology, we can do it. And so learning how to make, as a scientist, right, we weren't, on, we weren't entrepreneurs, we're not business people, we're just scientists, learning to make our story simple and easily communicated to people that may not have a scientific background was one of the big learning steps that we went through in doing this. And so that was the importance of branding and the importance of being able to communicate in simple language what it was that you were doing. So our first series, Series A, was $8 million. It was led by InterSouth partner, Polaris Ventures, and Boston Millennium. And InterSouth and, and Polaris had previously done uh, paradigm genetics, and so they did have some experience in the ag space. But there were not many ag investors at that time. There really wasn't. And we had 150, got started with 150K small business research loan from North Carolina Biotechnology Center, and, and it was really critical to our success to be able to have resources and be in an area like this that we were able to uh, uh, trawl on those uh, technologies. And we had milestones for technical progre progress. And so that's kind of how do you start up when you've got nothing? Well, you just put milestones in so that, okay, they'll put a little money at risk, but if you get to the next milestone, they'll put a little bit more money in and you can earn your value as you go. Because that's the only way you can really start from scratch. The technology, the Midas platform was the genomics, genes and proteins for ag and industrial uses. We, had a re we thought we were just going to mine these genes, hand them off to partners, they were going to put them in plants and see how they worked, and we were going to do a bunch of deals like this. Well, when we got out there 
everyone said, yeah, well, you got a bunch of, firstly, you had to find out if we could find new genes. We didn't know there were going to be many new genes left. And we started doing genomics, and we found a bunch of new genes eventually. Well, then the partners are like, well, how do we know the genes do anything? We were like, well, that's your job. We're going to give you the genes. You're going to pay us a lot of money, and you're going to figure out if they work. And then you're going to give us the royalty, right? Well, it didn't work out so well for us. Um, so we uh, ended up having to add entomology. Well, that's a whole speciality that you have to, you have to get bug colonies, and you have to maintain bug colonies, and you have to assay all these things. So now there was in biochemistry for herbicides. I mean, all of a sudden, you had to put some infrastructure in place. And then we would shown that some of the proteins can kill bugs. And they said, well, how do you know it'll work in plants? Well, OK, we had a transformation. We started making transgenic plants. Well, and then it's just obvious to take them to the field and see how they do there, because the next question is going to be, how, you know, how do they work in the field? And before you know it, we had um, plant analysis being done, and we had regulatory activities. Even just to bring things in the field, you have to have some regulatory activity. So we ended up with a regulatory department. And all of a sudden, we had a pipeline able to bring everything from discovery through uh, uh, plant testing through um, regulatory affairs. And then we raised the second series of $12.5 million, was announced in 2004. Um, InterSouth Partners, Polaris, and Boston Millennium were there, and we added Hunt Ventures and Eastman Ventures. Uh, and we had our first strategic partnership in place with Murtech LLC and Soybeans. And that's really what the investors are looking for, some validation in the market that somebody is interested in the technology that you have. So over the next few years, we, and, and, and during this time, we had made progress in the laboratory. We had discovered genes that were working. We had things that could control corn earworm, ECB, or the LEP complex. We had some neat genes for corn rootworm that were coming through. We had proven uh, efficacy with herbicide resistance. And some of these products were already in the market with other players, right? Some of those products already existed. But we were able to devise, devise novel genes that we could use, completely new ones, that, that Partners that didn't have access to that first generation of technology could use our genes instead and then develop their stacks where they were working with output traits or uh, uh, other generation traits. And so we were kind of providing an enablement to move to the next generation for some of these companies while we're also looking for things like novel genes for nematode. There was nothing in the market that controlled nematode. And we were able to find some really interesting nematode resistance gene. Soybean cyst nematode, multi-billion dollar yield losses every year. Huge opportunity. So there were new opportunities as well as meeting the needs of the old, old products and displacing them. And then we did a Series C, raised $13 million. It was led by Finisteer. Um, we had all of our partners participate. And during this time, we started to make um, partnerships. And when the first, uh, the, 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 what it did was provide access to the novel genes that we had in our, part, our pipeline. I mean, that's what the partnerships were like. And by plan or by accident, our first partnership was a non-exclusive arrangement to a lot of our technology that we had. So it was not exclusive. So you could still sell it to somebody else. But you realize that when you worked with big players, they didn't like the idea that, that you had already had a partner somewhere. But it really defined the tone of, well, what we're going to have, since we're really providing you know, genes that are similar, some cases similar to genes in the market, is it really going to have to be a non-exclusive arrangement? And so we were able to get a lot of deals put in place, ultimately, after we did our first deal with Monsanto. Once we did a deal with Monsanto, and that was really targeted towards sucking insects, which was a great unmet need, um, the true bugs, we were able to then move in with other partners once they saw you do, do a job, a, a deal with the big guy. They said, well, gee, we might be missing out. We better do something, too. And so that's one of the other lessons in doing an entrepreneurial company. If you can do a partnership with a big player, a lot of the other players will become more interested at that point. And so it's really worthwhile. Even doing a small deal with a big player is better uh, than not. Uh, we also had some funded research that was, was ongoing with our Corn Promotion Board and BSF. And we put alliances in place with Monsanto, Syngenta, Pioneer. We had some strategic partnerships. And all of this gave us market access, defined royalties in the agreement, and that allowed us to build a financial model for proje with projected revenues. And being able to have a business model with projected revenues is really how your enterprise is defined and value. And that was a lesson for me, I mean, a learning experience for me, is that you really have to have a good financial model where you can defend what the value of your enterprise is. 
So what are the key factors for success? First thing uh, VCs are going to look for is a good management team. Is it a management team that has done it before, and what is your val validation for that? So we had the track, the track record in industry having made products like this and had a success. Branding, make it easy to understand, the Midas technology. Flexible business model and research plan. We weren't intending to go and build this whole pipeline. We were just going to make genes and hand them off to partners. But you better be flexible because they might ask you to do entomology and to do nematodes. We really didn't want to do nematodes, right? And we're really just interested in that. But that's what the market was telling us they wanted. So OK, we're going to get a nematologist, and we're going to figure out how we're going to assay nematodes. Um, serendipity. Luck favors the well-prepared. We closed our first round in August 2001. If we had closed it two months later, we would have never had a deal, right? Because 9-11 happened. So sometimes it's just luck. You know, it's just being at the right place at the right time. That can make all the difference in the world. And ultimately, we had acquisition by Bayer. It was in excess of $400 million. They had, they had started a research center, and they needed to staff it here locally. So that was a good motivation for, the, for them to consider looking as well as ha having to be able to participate in some of the benefit of these values in crops that they didn't, weren't already in, in corn and soybeans. So they had technology that they could use, a technology platform that they could use in their ag space, as well as being a good fit for where they were in their business cycle. So that really worked out very well. And so that's kind of luck in a way. Uh, the jobs are retained. We had more than 65 employees. They were all able to continue on with Bear, which was very good. And we actually have products now with some regulatory approvals uh, that came out of this pipeline. And we have others that are heading to market with, with multiple partners. So we actually have genes and traits in the uh, pipelines of multiple partners that we had uh, during, the, uh, during that phase. Um, and so it was, was a lot of fun talking to you, and it's a lot of fun for the story. Um, any questions?